Best known for the song Bittersweet Symphony that you've probably heard in a million sports montages or remember as part of a late 90s Nike commercial, the British band The Verve had a pretty tumultuous history full of ego, litigation, drug addiction, infighting, and just some bad luck. To some outside the UK, The Verve were simply a one-hit wonder, but was that really the case? Today, let's take a look at the volatile history of The Verve. Hailing from the English town of Wigan, located in the Greater Manchester area, the town was economically depressed, and the Verve frontman Richard Ashcroft was no fan of his hometown, telling the alternative press, and I quote, If I hadn't made the decision to be in a band looking back on what was on offer in that town, it's quite a frightening prospect. The son of a part-time clerical worker and hairdresser mother, Ashcroft's family didn't really have much money and struggled to make ends meet. The young Ashcroft really couldn't afford to buy albums, so instead he taped songs from the radio and rifled through his parents' record collections, which was mostly made up of Pink Floyd and Beatles albums. Ashcroft would go through a few phases in his life, with the first wanting to be a footballer, dreaming of playing for Manchester United. He would eventually change his dream to becoming a rock star after witnessing a live gig by the Stone Roses. Ashcroft would tell Select Magazine, Seeing them play Warrington in 1989 basically changed my life. These guys looked and dressed like me, and they were from the same background, yet they were on stage being adored. Seeing them made me realize that I could do that as well. I could do better. But Ashcroft didn't have a lot of supporters who were behind him in his dream, and he would even tell a career counselor that he wanted to be a rock star, only to be offered the position of a lifeguard. On top of that, Ashcroft was told by a doctor that he had the lung capacity of a collapsed flea, and that he would likely suffer from a cold the rest of his life. But those kind of obstacles really did little to stand in his way, as his mother would reveal that from a young age her son was pretty cocky, with one schoolmate of his telling Select Magazine that he was nicknamed Jesus because he loved being the center of attention. Ashcroft would admit to Spin Magazine he knew he was destined to be a rock star, adding, I could sing the Lord's effing prayer when I was five years old, so I knew. It was at the age of 11 that Ashcroft's father would pass away from a brain hemorrhage that was the result of a dormant brain clot that eventually expanded. The tragic event would change his outlook on life with him telling Melody Maker in 1993, My father died when I was really young. He'd worked 9 to 5 all his life and he suffered and got nowhere. And I was 11 at the time and I immediately realized this wasn't the life for me. Immediately I found out how someone can just die, be wiped out. I thought F this, I'm going to do something positive. I can do something positive. I can do something great. I'm going to make something of myself. He would add how the event resulted in him losing a lot of his childhood innocence, telling Select Magazine, other kids were playing with their action men and I was questioning life and society. Ashcroft's mother would remarry and he would soon fall under the influence of his stepfather, who is a big believer in a 17th and 8th century movement named Rosicrucianism. Select Magazine would write about his stepfather and I quote, Richard firmly believed his stepdad could bend light rays around people to make them disappear or raise the temperature in the room by thought alone. Ashcroft was still coming to terms with the death of his father and figuring out who he was, adding, it's difficult for people to understand that they doubted calling you a lunatic. Ashcroft would meet bassist Simon Jones and drummer Peter Salisbury in high school, and it was when he attended Winstanley Sixth Form College where he studied philosophy, religion, and theater that he met guitarist Nick McCabe, who was a year ahead of him. The quartet soon formed the band Verve, whose name according to Ashcroft meant excitement and emotion. While Ashcroft and McCabe seemed like polar opposites, as the guitarist was more introverted and quiet, they had an uncanny chemistry with Nick telling Select Magazine, I could tell Richard was pretty much out of place like I was. Although he's almost the exact opposite of me, we got on really well. The band would rent a small rehearsal space at Splash Studios in Wigan, using their money from their unemployment checks playing from sunset until the late morning with Jones recalling to Rolling Stone. It had black curtains on all four walls, a low 70s polystyrene ceiling, a damp, tatty carpet. It stunk. It was freezing. We tried taking heaters down there, but it never helped much. The band's influences included avant-garde German rock, the Beatles, and funkadelic music, while also giving nods to groups like Primal Scream, The Stone Roses, James, U2, and The Rolling Stones, and their eclectic love of music combined with their penchant for psychedelic drugs, resulting in some of the first songs they wrote coming in in 8-10 to 10 minutes in length. The band would make their live debut at a friend's 18th birthday party in August of 1990 at a local pub where they played two songs, but the writing was on the wall. This was a band to watch. 
Verve opted not to play any more live shows for quite some time while they worked on new material, and the band would play their second show months later in February of 1991, and the buzz was building around them, with one reporter from Ashcroft's hometown writing, and I quote, by their second number, they were cooking on gas. Richard had the crowd of over 200 eating out of the palm of his hand. The band soon recorded a demo consisting of the tracks All in the Mind, The Sun, The Sea, Slide Away, and the instrumental track Verve Arising. While a few labels showed interest in the band, including Polydor and Sony, they would ultimately pass, but it would be Virgin Imprint Hut who signed the band. The label's A&R man, Miles Leonard, would tell Select Magazine, their demo was so much better than anything else I was hearing. I saw them at the boardwalk and Richard was already a complete star. The band was so innovative. Soon enough, the band played a showcase in the summer of 1991 in London for the head of Hutt who was glued to Ashcroft's performance with the head of the label telling Rolling Stone and I quote, I had the feeling of watching U2 really early on, like their second or third gig. There were about 20 people there, five or six of them from Virgin, and the rest just punters in for a bit of a drink. In front of nobody, Richard was climbing the PA speakers, and after seeing two numbers, he decided to sign the band in September of 1991. Despite Hutt's excitement for their new signing, their parent company Virgin didn't really see what all the fuss was about, and at one point the label didn't even bother paying for the group's hotel rooms, but that was about to change. In the meantime, Ashcroft would admit to Select Magazine he used his share of the advance money that he received from Hutt to binge on nothing but lasagna for six months. By December of 1991, the band would find their producer during a live gig when they opened for the band Whirlpool. It would be the Stone Roses producer John Lecky, who would be in the audience that night, recalling to Select Magazine, I'd gone to see Whirlpool, but got completely blown away by Verve. They were unlike anything I'd heard before, this incredibly intense but sensitive sound quite overwhelming but at the same time incredibly touching. I started following them around as a fan. Leckie for his part had worked with George Harrison, John Lennon and Sid Barrett as well as the Stone Roses and begged to work with Verve and that was the first time he had ever done that. In 1992 the band would release three singles, All in the Mind, She's a Superstar and Gravity Grave along with their self-titled EP in December of 1992. All of the singles topped the independent music charts in the UK and the buzz was soon building around the band as the next big thing since Suede. The hype would be partially propelled by the group's confidence and their egos. Verve's timing and business acumen was also impeccable, as them not being from London was also seen as a big plus, giving them time to hone their craft with Ashcroft telling Melody Maker in 1992, if you come from London, you've got people coming down to see you from the word go and writing you off early. Whereas we've had years, I've been in bands since I was 17, we've had years to get ready, and only when we were ready did we play a gig in London. We played one gig in London and we were signed up. Couple this with the fact that the band self-admittedly didn't listen to what the record label wanted or what was popular on the indie charts. It was in late 1992 the band hit the road with the Black Crows, with the following year proving to be a big year for the band. They would put out another single named Blue in the spring of 93, which was the lead single from their debut album, which was released in June. The psychedelic and space-tinged rock album was mostly recorded on the fly with the band members showing up to the studio with only three songs in hand. The album would be recorded with little sleep and the members using a lot of psychedelic drugs in the studio, and while the album has been looked upon favorably in the years after its release, it was something that producer John Leckie and the band initially seemed disappointed with at the time, with Leckie telling Select Magazine, We were searching for things and waiting for things and waiting for it to rain down on us, we came close, but neither they nor I thought they managed it. It lacked the overwhelming effect of the Verve experience. Maybe there was no audience to feed off of. The resulting record was a lot different than what was shown in their demos, with McCabe remarking at the time in the same interview, the band that Virgin signed we dished early on. The early demos were like Rolling Stone's power pop tunes. They bore no relation to what ended up on A Storm in Heaven. A Storm in Heaven, which was put out in June of 93, would peak at number 27 on the UK charts, leaving the band disappointed, and what followed was more frustration. After having several of their guitars stolen from their touring van, they would appear at the Glastonbury Festival using borrowed gear. It was during that gig Nick's amp would blow up and the subsequent dates would be called off, following the illnesses Richard and Nick came down with. Soon enough, the band lost their longtime manager who felt that he was too inexperienced to manage the group, and the band would also run into trouble with American label Verve, which threatened legal action against the band unless they changed their name. And at the urging of their label, they soon added the to their name, thus they became the Verve. A Storm in Heaven would be the only LP which bore the name Verve from their career. 
Despite the band's underwhelming commercial performance initially, that did little to dampen their cockiness with Ashcroft recalling at the time that the Verve and I quote, will be the biggest group in the world. It's only reasonable that we should be playing in front of 40,000 people minimum. History has a place for us. It may take three albums, but we'll get there. In addition to their cockiness, it would be pronouncements by Ashcroft, but like the one he told an interviewer when he said, and I quote, I don't ever want to get to the point where I don't think about death. Or, and I quote, I believe you can fly and I believe in astral travel that would lead to some in the British press referring to him as Mad Richard. The band would finish off 1993 joining Lollapalooza's traveling tour and supporting the Smashing Pumpkins during their tour of Europe. It was at the end of the year that they toured with a relatively unknown band at the time named Oasis who had just signed a record deal and they quickly bonded with the group. Thanks to the single Slide Away, the band made enough of an impression in America that the following summer they were once again asked to join Lollapalooza, but this time they did the full month and a half tour. The Verve would become the only British act on the bill, but they once again ran into trouble on the road. It was during a stop in Kansas City that the band's bassist was arrested after tossing hundreds of dollars of furniture out of his 15-story window. It was the same day Ashcroft would end up in the hospital, suffering from severe dehydration. For the band's second album, they would retreat to an isolated studio in Wales. By this point in time, the Verve were pretty burnt out. Ashcroft had just split from his longtime girlfriend of six years. McCabe, meanwhile, was suffering from depression, as his girlfriend was also pregnant with their first child. An employee of the band's label would tell Slide Magazine about what McCabe was going through at the time, saying he was building up a huge dose of paranoia. He thought everyone was against him. No amount of praise registered either. It would result in Oasis producer Owen Morris, who was working with The Verve at the time, clashing with McCabe. Ashcroft, meanwhile, would disappear for days without telling anyone where he was going, and only adding to the volatile mix was that the band was taking a lot of ecstasy and would sometimes jam for days, only for a fragment of a good song idea to be flushed out. The resulting album would be A Northern Soul, which would sell more copies in one month than its predecessor had in total, and things were looking good for the band. But like everything in the Verve's history, trouble was brewing. The bad luck that followed the band on their last tour once again made a reappearance as they started to promote their second album. It was at a show in Paris with Oasis, McCabe lost his backstage pass and would be beaten up by the venue's security guards, resulting in the band cancelling subsequent shows. Meanwhile, Ashcroft would return home after a break from touring, learning that he had failed to make rent payments and saw his home chained up. On top of that, his landlord would steal his possessions. By August of 1995, McCabe and Ashcroft's relationship had deteriorated to the point that the pair were barely speaking to each other and Ashcroft would eventually decide to break up the band three months after their second album came out. The head of the band's label would tell Select Magazine about this time, saying, Looking back, something clearly had to give. They'd been together since they were 18. They were young men with lives of their own, and they needed time alone to figure out who they were. While much has been written in the press about the band's breakup, Ashcroft claimed it was quite simple, telling Rolling Stone Magazine, and I quote, It's just growing up. We gone from being teenagers to being adults in a band for everyone to see. All we did was have a communication problem, end of story. Despite breaking up the Verve, Ashcroft still wanted to work with Jones and Salisbury and brought in old schoolmate Simon Tong to play guitar and keyboards. McCabe would return to Wigan meanwhile to spend time with his daughter and worked on his own music. For Ashcroft, this time proved to be a musical rebirth. As sleeve designer Brian Cannon would recall to Select Magazine, it was the most creative period Richard had ever had. There was no fighting or tension. All he had to do was get the songs together. Producer John Leckie would listen to the material the musicians had come up with, totaling upwards of 32 tracks, urging them to record the material. Written during this time were the songs Bittersweet Symphony, The Drugs Don't Work, which paid homage to Ashcroft's deceased father. In addition to that, they come up with Space and Time, One Day, and Sonnet. Despite the positive steps, there was still a missing piece. Leckie would tell Select Magazine, but we never got anything finished. Richard was looking for his Keith Richards. We also knew each other too well. It was a shame because there was an amazing maturity to the new songs and a literary quality to the lyrics that they never had before. The band soon went through several producers before finally connecting with Killing Joke bassist Youth. Youth would urge Ashcroft to have a more structured working regimen in the studio, pushing the musicians to not work at night and rather work during the day, and things went well with the demos becoming fully flushed out songs. At one point Ashcroft thought about giving up working on Bittersweet Symphony, and Youth would tell an interviewer at the time, This was certainly the most successful track I've done. 
I think Richard had actually cut a version with John Lackey, but by the time I came on board, he didn't want to do the song. I persuaded him to have a go at cutting a version, but at first he wasn't really into it. It was only once we put the strings on it that he started getting excited. Then towards the end, Richard wanted to chuck all the album away and start again. What was my reaction? Horror. Sheer horror. All I could say was, I really think you should reconsider. By this point in time, Ashcroft knew the name of the album was going to be Urban Hymns, but didn't plan on using the Verve moniker to release it. But something still didn't feel right. The band hadn't found the right guitarist to replace McCabe, and it eventually led to Nick rejoining the band. It was during Christmas in 1996 that the two finally mended fences, with McCabe recording his guitar parts over songs the band had recorded thus far, performing the guitar parts for The Drugs Don't Work and Sonnet in just one take. With McCabe now back in the band, they would write another half a dozen songs to finish up the album. The band soon expanded from a four-piece to a five-piece, with second guitarist Simon Tong staying on board, and with the band getting heavyweight manager Jazz Summers to support them. Summers, for his part, had previously steered Wham! through the 80s. The Verve looked forward to 1997 with confidence. But much like The Verve's past history, trouble was brewing once again. The tour to support the album would be inevitably delayed after Ashcroft, who was suffering from a viral condition, collapsed during rehearsals. Then on the eve of the band releasing their third album, Urban Hymns, perhaps one of the most devastating things to hit their career would happen. It had turned out the orchestral arrangement for Bittersweet Symphony was sampled from the Andrew Oldham Orchestra. Andrew Oldham, for his part, used to be the Rolling Stones manager, and in reality there was no Andrew Oldham Orchestra but rather it was just a name used for recordings that were made by Oldham, who used a number of session musicians, including the members of the Rolling Stones. Back in the 60s, it was common for orchestras to do covers of famous pop and rock songs, and the sample the Verve used was actually a cover of the Rolling Stones song, The Last Time, which was penned by members Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. While the Verve had permission to sample the Andrew Oldham Orchestra's recording, they didn't have permission from the Rolling Stones, which the orchestral arrangement was based off of. It's important to note that the orchestral arrangement is not part of the Rolling Stones version of the song, and that's where things get a little complicated and tricky. The copyright to the Rolling Stones song was owned by a company named ABKCO, which was run by a controversial businessman named Alan Klein, who was a ruthless negotiator. Klein would be involved with both the Beatles and the Rolling Stones during his career, and while he would save the Beatles from the brink of bankruptcy, his involvement in the group in the late 60s appeared to be a catalyst or one of the factors in them breaking up. The Stones, meanwhile, would accuse Klein of withholding royalty payments, stealing publishing from them, and accuse them of not paying their taxes for half a decade. Klein would end up holding the copyrights to all of the Rolling Stones songs prior to 1971. By the time EMI and Virgin realized their mistake, they tried to get a licensing agreement from Klein as huge quantities of the group's third album had already been manufactured and Bittersweet Symphony was already released as a single and getting airplay on the radio. It would be the Verve's manager, Jazz Summers, who would end up calling ABKCO, speaking with Klein, who flat out said no to giving a licensing agreement as he didn't believe in the idea of sampling. And in a last ditch effort, the head of the Verve's label, Virgin, would fly to New York to meet with Klein in person and played him Bittersweet Symphony. Klein knew that the band was in a jam, as was the label, and would agree to licensing the last time under the condition that there was a 50 50 split for the song's royalties. However, as Bittersweet Symphony started to pick up steam, Klein would change his position and would claim that the Verve sampled too much of the last time and sued the band for plagiarism. The case would end up being settled out of court as the Verve didn't want to spend thousands of dollars in a prolonged legal battle. The settlement would include Mick Jagger and Keith Richards being listed as co-writers on the track, and the band would hand over 100% of their royalties to the pair as well. The Verve would relinquish all publishing rights to the song, and Bittersweet Symphony would not just be the biggest song of the band's career, but one of the biggest songs of the 90s, and appear in advertisements, and should have netted the band a lot of money, but it didn't, at all, at least not initially. By 2018, Ashcroft had only made $1,000 off of Bittersweet Symphony, which was paid to him as part of the settlement deal. Billboard.com would estimate that the song netted about $5 million in royalties in its lifetime due to radio airplay and licensing agreements, and if this whole debacle with the Stones hadn't happened, Ashcroft could have likely made at least $2.5 million from the song. The Verve frontman would later remark that Bittersweet Symphony was, and I quote, the best song Jagger and Richards have wrote in 20 years. To make matters worse, the Verve had no control over how the song was to be used, so if companies wanted to license the track, the Verve couldn't say no, and that was the case when Nike asked to use a song. 
The band said no, so the company went to Alan Klein, who licensed the track. The song would end up becoming one of ABKCO's most lucrative tracks. But the legal problems didn't end there for The Verve as Andrew Oldham would end up suing the band for $1.7 million over unpaid royalties. But perhaps the saddest part of this whole thing was that Andrew Oldham never composed the original orchestral arrangement. It was a composer named David Whitaker who received no compensation for his work being sampled by The Verve. What makes this legal dispute even more complicated is that the Rolling Stones song The Last Time was actually inspired by another song, a 1958 track called This May Be The Last Time by the Staple Singers. As for the Nike commercial, it proved to be a huge moment in the Verve's career. Though Bittersweet Symphony had gotten play on college and alternative rock radio, it was the Nike ad that propelled the single to show up on mainstream radio stations, resulting in the song spending four months on the charts, peaking at number 63 on the US Hot 100 charts, and meanwhile the album Urban Hymns would see their sales double since the Nike ad aired, resulting in it moving over a million copies across America. Meanwhile across the pond, Urban Hymns would become the fifth fastest selling record in UK history, selling a quarter of a million copies in its first week. As the band hit the road to support the album, trouble brewed once again. By the summer of 1998, guitarist Nick McCabe quit the band. The Verve's London-based publicity firm Coalition would announce to MTV, and I quote, McCabe's decision has been forced by the increasing stress of touring. McCabe hadn't quit the band permanently at the time, as there were hopes that if they went back into the studio, he would rejoin them. But by April of 1999, The Verve called it quits, with Ashcroft releasing a statement that read, The decision to split this band did not come without a great deal of stress to me personally. I've always given everything to the band and would have continued to do so if the circumstances had not made it impossible. It was following the breakup of The Verve that Ashcroft would pursue a solo career, while the remaining members of the band formed the group The Shining, who would put out an album before disbanding. And it was during the band's time apart that a reunion of The Verve seemed unlikely, as Ashcroft would tell an interviewer, you're more likely to get all four Beatles on stage. But in 2007, The Verve would announce that they were reuniting. It was said that McCabe and Salisbury were in talks about a new musical project, when Ashcroft got wind of it and made amends with his former bandmates and the Verve soon reformed, but the reunion would see the band go back to being a four-piece, not including Tong. Jones would reveal at the time, it would have been too hard, it's hard enough for the four of us, if you bring more people to it, it's harder to communicate, and communication has always been our difficulty. The band's reunited lineup would play English Arena as they'd make appearances at Coachella and the European Summer Festival circuit before putting out their fourth album, appropriately titled Fourth. Fourth would see the band blend the more experimental elements of their early records with more structured songwriting approach they used on Urban Hymns. The album would end up topping the UK charts, but by 2009 the band was once again finished after a period of inactivity. Jones and McCabe were no longer on speaking terms with Ashcroft, with the pair claiming that the Verve's reunion only happened to help Ashcroft's sagging solo career. McCabe and Jones would form the band Black Submarine, and in 2017 McCabe would claim there was no sign of a reunion on the horizon, but back in 2019 the band would be in the news once again, when Mick Jagger and Keith Richards gave the publishing of Bittersweet Symphony back to the Verve. Richard Ashcroft would put a statement at the time reacting to the news saying, I never had a personal beef with the Stones. They've always been the greatest rock and roll band in the world. It's been a fantastic development. It's life affirming in a way. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again in Rock Roger Stories. Take care.